Hello everyone and welcome back to Bomb Chew. I'm Chris. I'm Austin. And today we're taking a look at the Humble Choice Bundle for November 2020. We're currently in the middle of a contentious election here in the United States, and at least as of this recording, the race still hasn't been called. So now seems like the perfect time for a nice bundle of games to come along and help keep us distracted for a bit while we wait for the dust to settle. Let's see what Humble has in store for us this month. This month's Humble Original is Tori. You are a stranger in another land. Or maybe the afterlife? I got heavy vibes of King Yama's desk from Dragon Ball Z at the start of this game. Why are you here? I'm not sure. You collect wings and memories by solving puzzles. You carry a big heavy box on your back, which you can set down to mark off shapes, which you touch to make the box turn into an interactive spot that makes ethereal ramps and platforms solid and allows you to run and slide really quickly. Yeah, it's a really weird game to put into words, and there's a lot in the story that I'm uncertain about, but what I am certain about is that I love the visuals. And while playing it, I can just flow and know what I need to do, which feels really good. I kind of wish I could be fast all the time, but at the same time, being slow sometimes makes me appreciate being fast when I am. I can recommend you try this based on the art alone, but if you like the gameplay, that's even better. Townsman, A Kingdom Rebuilt is a resource management slash city builder game from developer Handy Games and released in February of 2019. Townsman has you taking control over a small village, and you're tasked with helping the village to grow and thrive in a medieval setting. You'll need to balance various resources such as food, gold, building supplies, and the general happiness of your people on the way to your success. The buildings you can construct will help to expand and manage these resources, and will be the main focal point of the gameplay loop of your average playthrough. The tutorials are surprisingly deep and involved, holding your hand as they guide you through a series of training scenarios. Even though the tutorial can start to feel like it's going on for too long, I'd rather have that instead of a lackluster or altogether missing tutorial. Overall, however, as far as the gameplay is concerned, Townsman is a very simple game. Like, suspiciously simple. Something about placing the buildings and seeing that little progress bar started giving me mobile game vibes, so I looked it up and lo and behold, this is an expanded port of a mobile game. Not all mobile games are automatically bad, and the same goes for PC ports of mobile games, but Townsman is just too simple an experience to really keep your attention when you're not playing on a phone. Most of the time you're just sitting there watching progress bars go up while you wait for something to happen. This might fly while playing on a phone, but as a full PC game, it's just not enough. The art style and presentation is nice without feeling too cheap or basic, but other than that, there's just not enough going on here. While the simple and mostly laid-back pace of gameplay might provide for a nice distraction, at least for fans of the genre, it seems like the experience would work better on a phone, if it works at all. Either way, I won't be spending any more time with Townsman. Europa is a gravity-bending 3D puzzle platformer. The land is torn apart, and you... whatever you are, show up to restore the land and figure out just what the heck you are. You cover yourself with paint, which you get to design yourself. I made something pretty confusing and decided to scrap it, so for the rest of this video you'll see me in plain purple. This paint represents your health. When you get hurt or fall into the void, you lose some of your paint. Lose it all, and you'll have to start the current area over again. You have suction cups for feet, so you make cute little pops with every step you take. But also you can walk up curved surfaces onto walls and ceilings. You have a rope tied around your foot that dangles to let you know which way is down at any given time. You'll need to solve puzzles to power on platforms and doors, and every once in a while you'll get a new power which will help you open paths that were previously locked off to you. On paper, I should love this game, and I was excited to play it. However, actually trying it out, I found myself just not having a great time. The camera feels very weird when transitioning to a wall, and made me feel kind of sick at times. Movement also didn't feel very good, which is kind of your bread and butter in a platformer. I noticed the rope somewhat early in my time playing, but it was small enough that I kept forgetting about it and didn't notice it most of the time, leading to occasional frustrating falls. The powers you get aren't very satisfying, they're just kind of required. Like your first power allows you to freely look around the area, which is usually used to see a puzzle solution that is obscured from you when actually looking at the puzzle. 
I like the idea of this power, but it doesn't feel great to use and there's nothing satisfying about it to me. It seems more like a crutch to help you figure out your path through some of the convoluted levels, rather than designing the levels and gameplay around making it fun to explore. If Super Mario Galaxy is an example of a gravity game done right, Europa is not on the other end of the spectrum, but it falls somewhere in the middle. It's just okay. At least as far as I got with it. Maybe it gets better, but it didn't make a great first impression on me. Rover Mechanic Simulator is a simulation game from developer Pyramid Games and released on Early Access in February of this year. Rover Mechanic Simulator is exactly what it sounds like. It's a simulation game in the vein of Car Mechanic Simulator, but you're working on Mars rovers instead of classic cars. You'll be given access to different missions, requiring you to fix a number of issues on varying models of rovers. You're usually given at least some indication of the problem that needs to be fixed as a starting point. Once you load the rover onto the table, you can begin examining and disassembling the rover. Examining each part will show its condition and indicate if it needs to be replaced or not. Some parts will just require you to remove them and 3D print a new one. More complex parts, such as wheel engines, will require further disassembly and diagnostics before specific replacement parts can be printed. Taking things off, replacing parts, and reassembling the rover isn't as complex as you might think, which, for me, is definitely a good thing. Whenever you remove something from the rover, the parts go directly into your inventory, so you can easily check what you've removed and what's broken. When it's time to put it all back together, highlighted areas show the parts that need to go on next, and everything slots into place automatically. All you have to do is click the parts into place and screw them down. No fighting with janky physics and bad collision detection like in last month's Fantasy Blacksmith. Just nice and simple, point and click. This really helped me ease into a rhythm while working on these rovers. As you progress and complete quests, you'll earn money as well as experience. When you level up, you'll be able to allocate points into a perk tree, allowing you to gain different passive abilities like more XP from quests, more money from completing repairs, and shorter 3D printing times. For the longest time, I've thought these mechanic and random job simulation games were a waste of my time, as I've always understated the appeal, but never been able to really get into any of them. However, Rover Mechanic Simulator is simple enough with just the right learning curve, all without sacrificing the complexity and attention to detail these kind of games are known for. I really felt myself settling into that elusive zen-like state while playing, and it was a surprising amount of fun. Rover Mechanic Simulator surprised the hell out of me, and even if you're not a fan of the genre, I'd suggest giving it a shot. Chiok is a point-and-click adventure game from developer Onu Studio and released in November of 2018. You are placed in the shoes of a young princess named Chiok. Your mother, the queen, has gone off to fight a monster and protect her kingdom. While gone, the royal wizard has decided to seize power and locks the princess in the dungeon. Your goal is to escape, and hopefully put a stop to the evil wizard's plans. It's a fairly straightforward and basic fantasy story, but it's fairly well executed. However, the actual gameplay can be very frustrating at times. This is more of an old-school point-and-click adventure game, so expect a lot of clicking around on random items, as well as using whatever items you have on everything you can see until something happens. The game will even throw in the occasional timed event as well, adding an extra layer of pressure that can be exciting when you figure it out in time, but feels frustrating and unnecessary whenever you're struggling for the solution. Luckily, the game is incredibly generous with the autosaves, and any time I actually reached a failure point, I was almost always set to the point right before I clicked on whatever caused my downfall. The whole experience just feels very uneven. Progressing from room to room is definitely satisfying at times, but finding yourself repeating the same time sequence over and over quickly grinds your progress to a halt, and most of the time it's just not fun to do. One of the main points that is going to draw a lot of people into this game is the art style. Chiak has a very charming 2D style that is animated by hand, frame by frame. The end result gives off a lot of strong Dragon Slayer and Dom Bluth vibes, and it's easily my favorite aspect of this game. It makes me want to keep playing and solving puzzles, if only so I can see more of these very well designed and beautifully animated cutscenes play out. Chiak is a simple but sometimes frustrating experience. It feels like they went too archaic and basic with the gameplay, in order to focus more on the animation and presentation. The end result is a game that's beautiful, charming, and a joy to look at, but isn't all that fun to play most of the time. If you like classic point-and-click adventure games, or can forgive the gameplay shortcomings in exchange for a great visual experience, definitely Chiak it out. Eh? Darkwood is a top-down survival horror game that does not want to hold your hand. The game tells you this when you start, and it's not joking. 
I got stuck for an embarrassing amount of time on the prologue in a couple of different sections just trying to figure out how to progress. You're in the woods and there are monsters that come out at night. You'll need to go out during the day to gather supplies to keep yourself healthy, keep your shelter barricaded, and keep the lights on. Because once the lights go out, nothing will keep the monsters away. The woods are randomly generated, but once you start a playthrough, it doesn't seem to keep changing, as after I died, I was able to walk back to the spot where I had been killed and loot my body for the supplies I dropped. And everything looked the same along the way. This game is really hard, and intentionally avoids showing you information beyond a few tutorial messages, so you can figure everything out on your own. You'll do a lot of scavenging and crafting, and probably a lot of dying. The gameplay is definitely not for me, but it does have a great atmosphere, and it definitely seems like the developers made exactly what they were hoping to make here. If you're into games that ask a lot of you as a player, and you're looking for some good horror, you'll probably feel right at home here. Smile For Me is a point-and-click adventure game from developer Limbo Lane and released in May of 2019. Smile For Me is strange, and I'm going to try and keep things vague, as I feel a big part of the appeal for this game is that fresh first-time experience. The game starts with a message from Dr. Habit, who has created some kind of resort to try and cheer people up, or at least that's what their website claims. You can tell almost right away that there's something not quite right here in the habitat. The art style and world design feels very inspired by Psychonauts, and it certainly makes the characters interesting and memorable. However, there's this underlying feeling of dread and fear that seems to lie just beneath the surface and around every corner. Daily PSA messages from Dr. Habit start getting oddly specific, and their goals don't seem especially focused on making anyone actually happy. There are strict rules in the habitat, one of which is a nightly curfew. Failing to return to your room at night will result in punishment, in the form of Dr. Habit's bedtime stories for insomniacs and bad children. Without going into too much detail, they're intensely unnerving, and I found myself having to peek through my fingers a few times while playing. It definitely made me want to be a good boy and go to bed on time. Gameplay is more or less a basic point-and-click game. You have an inventory of items, which you'll expand by doing favors for characters and solving puzzles. Using these items in the right place will result in unlocking more areas to explore, as well as making the residents happy. While talking to other characters, you'll occasionally be able to respond by either moving your view up and down to nod yes, or shaking it left and right to say no. It's simple, but it makes you feel involved in the gameplay on more than a point-and-click puzzle level. Smile for me took me completely by surprise, but I'm really digging it so far. It feels like playing through a video game version of Don't Hug Me I'm Scared, This House Has People In It, or any of the other deceptively horror-themed Adult Swim Midnight specials. I'll definitely be seeing this one through to the end. Little Misfortune is a narrative-focused adventure game from developer Kill Monday Games and released in September of 2019. Players take control of the titular Miss Fortune, an odd little girl in an even stranger representation of what appears to be Sweden. The game opens with a narrator explaining that Miss Fortune will die at the end of this game, before being interrupted by the little girl, who can apparently hear him as well. He quickly distracts her and entices her to begin a journey by offering her the prize of eternal happiness. Miss Fortune grabs her trusty bottle of glitter and heads out on a bizarre, dark, but also funny and charming adventure. Gameplay is pretty bare-bones, with you moving misfortune left or right, observing or interacting with objects in the environment, throwing glitter, and making branching decisions as you go. It's hard to tell how much these decisions actually matter, since I haven't yet finished the game, but in my initial playthrough, there seems to be a fair bit of variety, at least in the form of additional scenes and dialogue. Throwing glitter in certain sad or depressing areas will cause a cartoon that fixes it to pop up, as well as seemingly making misfortune's heart grow stronger. I'm not really sure what kind of impact this mechanic might have on the game, but it's a nice little added touch that helps to flesh out the world as well as the gameplay. While the gameplay is simple, without a ton of variety outside of the occasional minigame, the main draw here is definitely the writing, atmosphere, and overall story. As her name would imply, bad luck and general dismay seem to follow misfortune everywhere she goes, which leads you into some pretty interesting and absolutely bizarre scenarios. I don't want to spoil too much, but at one point I was presented with the option to kick a bird in the balls. So yeah, this game is pretty amazing. The writing is really top-notch, with the dialogue between the narrator and Miss Fortune carrying the entire game on their backs. The voice actor for Miss Fortune is absolutely my favorite part of the game, as her adorable and charming voice helps to highlight the great writing. The narrator also does a great job, and gives off some really strong Stanley Parable vibes. Little Misfortune isn't perfect, however. The story and atmosphere really jumps around, sometimes going straight from a profoundly dark and morbid scene into a literal poop joke. 
It's also addressing a lot of very serious themes and issues with a nonchalant demeanor. It's not necessarily done in a way that tries to belittle or make light of these issues, but I can definitely see how it might come off that way to some people. Despite some of these issues, I'm really loving my time with Little Misfortune so far. In fact, I had to force myself to stop playing so I could continue working on the rest of the bundle. It's more than a little weird and deals with some heavy issues at times, but it's executed in such a charming and strangely endearing fashion that I can't wait to go back and finish the game. Darksburg is a co-op Diablo-style roguelite. You can, of course, play alone, but I recommend bringing some friends because this game is tough. Everyone will pick a character to play as, and then you'll be put into a procedurally generated level together with a mission to complete. Like fight your way to the docks, for example. And fight you will, there are monsters everywhere. You have abilities to help you through, and you don't have to worry about mana, only cooldowns. I played as the Battle Nun, who had some pretty fun moves at her disposal. As a team, you share experience, so you level up together, and the perks you can pick from when you level up are random every time, so you'll have to try out new builds your first several times playing. Health items are rare, so you'll have to keep each other safe, which is easier said than done. While playing, you'll earn a special currency, which you can use when you die, to buy perks to equip on your character to make things a bit easier. However, I think you have to beat the mission you're playing before you're allowed to keep any of that currency, and me and my group kept dying on the first mission, try as we might. If we played a lot more, we could probably eventually beat the first level by the skin of our teeth, but it seems very punishing to give players no reward at all to help them along when you have a system for it already built into your game. If you have some friends to play with and you live and breathe ARPGs and roguelites, definitely give this one a try. But if you like to play either of those genres casually, approach with caution. The gameplay is fun, but the structure is brutal. Crying Sons is a strategy sci-fi roguelite with an emphasis on story. You must command a ship across randomly generated maps, bolstering and upgrading your ship and your fleet as well as searching for fuel and other interesting items along the way. Looking at the description and screenshots for this game, I was kind of dreading it, but a lot of it took me by surprise. Tutorials ease you through menus and battles, and also help you understand what you're seeking out and why. Battles are fun and engaging, with a rock-paper-scissors weakness system for squadrons you send out and the option to target enemy ships' weapons, squadron bay, or hull. There are several random story encounters where you can send a team to explore, with clear expectations set in terms of what you can get and what you can lose. And there's some really interesting story and world building. It seems you get more story by beating chapters, and it seems you have to clear three maps to finish a chapter, at least for chapter one. I haven't died yet, but reading up on permadeath, it seems dying sends you back to the beginning of a chapter, but there are ships to unlock and new worlds to explore each time. You can take some time to look around and try to upgrade whatever you can, but doing so risks having a rough encounter that will set you back, and exploring too much will trigger an alert that starts to spread through the map, and you do not want to let it catch up to you, or you will have a serious fight on your hands. This is one of the few times I've heard people compare a game to FTL and thought, yes, I agree. It's not a clone, but it's clearly inspired by FTL. Oh yeah, and the pixel art here is gorgeous. That definitely helped pull me in too. We got a pretty meh Battlestar Galactica game in a choice bundle earlier this year, and it's crazy how much better this game works as a Battlestar game without actually having the license attached to it. Imperator Rome is a grand strategy war game from developer Paradox Interactive and released in April of 2019. What's that? A deep, complex strategy game, and one from Paradox Interactive as well? You know what that means, boys and girls. That's right! Let's get ready for lots of reading, unhelpful tutorials, and mechanics so deep and complex you'll be convinced that the devs made this game specifically to mock your lack of intelligence. In all seriousness, Imperator Rome is going to look immediately familiar to anyone who's played Crusader Kings. If this is your first time being exposed to Paradox Interactive, steal your resolve and set aside a good chunk of time for learning the basics before you jump into this one. The gameplay mechanics are incredibly deep and complex, especially for newcomers to the genre. You'll be taking control of one of the different factions seeking to conquer as much of the world as you can. You'll need to be able to balance your attention between your military forces, diplomatic deals, keeping your people at home fed and happy, stopping plots to take out power from underneath you, and various other grand strategy gameplay staples. 
The one thing I've always liked about grand strategy games, at least in theory, is the amount of depth in the world and setting presented to the player. It truly makes you feel like you're in the seat of power, complete with the nightmare list of decisions and choices that power would come with. If all this information was presented to the player in a more intuitive way, this could make for an incredible game that would be able to contend with Total War and Civilization as my strategy game of choice. However, everything about Imperator Rome is overwhelming from moment zero. There's a glut of information blasting the player in the face at all times, and it's often hard trying to decipher what it is you're looking at. The tutorial doesn't help much either. The only option for learning in-game is a list of starter objectives to try to help you learn some of the mechanics. The lack of a real interactive tutorial completely hobbles the onboarding process, and it just left me confused, frustrated, and with a throbbing headache. I'll be honest, I hate Imperator Rome. I understand the appeal of a Paradox Interactive-style grand strategy game, even if I've never been a fan myself. Imperator Rome is just a bad take on that genre, which is surprising considering this is made by Paradox Interactive. Normally I'd say that fans of the genre or developer would enjoy the game, but online reviews for it are pretty low as well, with most fans calling it the worst grand strategy game that Paradox Interactive has ever made. Recent updates seem to be polarizing fans even further, making this look like a questionable choice for anyone except the most hardcore fans. I guess you could say, it's imperative that you stay away from Imperator Rome. Yakuza Kiwami 2 is a remake of Yakuza 2 and sequel to Yakuza Kiwami. Alert! Alert! I have not played Yakuza 3 through 6, so all of my knowledge comes from playing Zero and Kiwami. Please do not crucify me if I get something wrong or get excited about something that shows up elsewhere in the series. This is all we have access to on the PC. With that out of the way, stop right there! If you haven't played a Yakuza game yet and are interested in playing the whole series, I highly suggest you start with Yakuza 0, as it's fantastic, and it also goes on sale for super cheap, and serves as a prequel. Yakuza Kiwami runs on the same engine, and the two games have a very similar feel to them while having different stories and scopes. Yakuza Kiwami 2 runs on a new engine that's shared with Yakuza 6, and it's a huge upgrade. If you play this one first, you may not be able to tolerate some of what's missing in the previous two games. That being said, the story here mostly stands as its own thing, so if you don't care about playing them all, this is a fine place to start. If you aren't familiar with these games, you play as Kazuma Kiryu, an ex-member of the Yakuza who is super serious and always getting wrapped up into trouble with warring clans. This plays out through dramatic cutscenes spoken entirely in Japanese, with core gameplay involving beating your enemies to a pulp with your fists or any weapons you can find. However, Yakuza is so much more than this. When you aren't working on progressing the story, the cities of Kamurocho and Sotenbori invite you to explore them with restaurants, shops, and entertainment around every corner. You can invite another character to do karaoke with you, go drinking at the bar, drop some quarters at the arcade to play Virtua on, or try your hand at winning a prize in a UFO catcher. Speaking of which, pour one out for Sega's arcade business. Let's take a moment of silence. There are also side stories scattered all over the maps, and these are the real draw for me. These range from fascinating to hilarious, and while they aren't always rewarding in terms of money or items you'll get, I take joy in completing them all. Oh yeah, and this game comes with the return of the Cabaret Club game that was in Yakuza 0. I don't care what this looks like on screen, this minigame is addictive, and I'm so happy to have more of it injected into my veins. I mean, more of it to play. In terms of engine upgrades, graphics are dramatically improved, and you can freely walk so many more places than before, and with no loading zones. Want to go into a restaurant? Walk right in the door. Take an elevator and explore a whole building. This really adds to the immersion. Also different this time around is how experience works. You get experience of different types anytime you fight, eat, complete missions, or do pretty much anything. You can buy yourself all sorts of upgrades like new moves, improved health and damage, a bigger stomach, and beyond. You've probably noticed some stuttering issues in my recording, and unfortunately, my recording software just wouldn't behave here, but the game performs rock solid for me. This game is a treat, as is the rest of the series on PC so far. If you haven't tried one of these games yet, this is a series I never hesitate to recommend. Darksiders 3 is the latest mainline entry in the Darksiders series. These games have lore shared between them, but if you haven't played the others, you'll be just fine. In this entry, you play as Fury, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. 
Heaven and Hell are duking it out on Earth, and you're not really on either side. You're just here to hunt down the seven deadly sins. Each game in the series plays a bit differently from the last. Not so different that it's an entirely different genre, but a different action genre nonetheless. This time, it's a Souls-like game. Weak enemies can take you out if they're in a group and you don't bring your A-game. Dodging at the right time acts kind of like a parry, allowing you to do a counterattack. You have healing items that you can restore for free by killing enemies. There are checkpoints spread around where you can spend currency to purchase items or level up. And you lose all your currency when you die, unless you can make it back to your body to reclaim what you lost. There's an option to switch to the classic battle system, which is described as being more hack and slash, but I went with the default style to play the developer's intended version of the game. Outside of the typical Souls-like stuff, you have a cool chain whip that you can use to grapple your way across gaps. It's fun, at least for me, and I've already died a few times, which hasn't been frustrating so far. It also, thankfully, has a compass to show me where the next main mission is, allowing me to split off the path if I want to go exploring, or not get stuck figuring out where to go when I'm ready to progress the story. It's not the deepest and most engaging Souls-like you've ever played, but it is a good mixture of Darksiders with the Souls-like genre, and I'm excited to play more. So overall, how was this bundle? Man, lots of dark games. Darkwood, Darksburg, Darksiders. It's good to see Humble throw in some horror around Halloween. I know it's not October anymore, but heck, it was a week ago. Tori was a great Humble original. Weird, unique, kind of hard to describe, and importantly, fun. Yakuza Kiwami 2 and Darksiders 3 are solid headliners, and I know Yakuza is here to serve as an ad for Like a Dragon coming out this month, but that doesn't make it any less of a good game. Some of these were definitely not for me, but everything here with the exception of Imperator has been reviewed positively, so there's a sizable audience for them. I'm mostly in agreement with Austin here. I was pretty sad that we didn't get any real horror in the October bundle, but hey, better late than never. There's also a wide variety of horror available in these couple of games, offering a little bit of something for everyone, even non-horror fans. While there were still a few lackluster games this month, with Imperator Rome standing out as the worst of the bunch, this is clearly a great selection of games that's easy to recommend everyone to check out. People on the Classic and Premium plans get all 12 games once again this month, and this has been happening long enough that it seems like it's here to stay. So from now on, we won't bring it up again, unless there's a month where we don't get all the games. Finally, we'd like to give a big thank you to Blake Harms, Michael Slater, and to all of our patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you all next time. Hey, by the way, it's the five-year anniversary of Humble Monthly and Humble Choice. To celebrate, we've got a bonus video reviewing the original Humble Monthly bundle from November 2015. Check it out and see just how much the bundle has changed over the years.